So we're going to finish up talking about how we control how strong you are in some ways, and then we're going to move into what I imagine will be a more, uh, what I imagine will be a more interesting topic for you guys talking about adaptations for resistance training. So if you guys really want to grow out for some period of time, how big can your muscles get? How strong are you going to be? What sort of things matter, right? Should you be doing this or that or whatever, you know, on, on those things, okay? So let's, let's review just a little bit from, from the other day. Okay, let's review just a little bit. Who remembers, okay, what the crossword cycle is? Who remembers the crossword cycle? Right, I got a few hands on all of that. Who, who, somebody tell me based upon what you remember. Why is the crossword cycle important? It's how our muscles contract. Okay, that's a that's a reasonable, reasonably close, not reasonably close. Okay, in the crossword cycle, what do we use? energy to do? What do we use ATP to do in the crossword cycle? Close, but not quite. To relax, to break actin and myosin apart. Okay? So remember, when I actin and myosin put together, okay, what do we call it? What's that called? We're close. What precedes the power? What do you have to have before we get a power stroke? Cross bridge, right? Actin and myosin bind together. That forms a cross bridge. Then we get a power stroke where the myosin head tilts and pulls the actin. It slides along, right? We've now done a concentric contraction. Then ATP comes in and binds and releases the actin and myosin. We split the ATP into ADP and an organic phosphate, and that, in essence, recocks the myosin head. So now it's back in its high energy state, and it's ready to bind a second time. Okay. Every time you do a muscle contraction, you are doing that exact thing thousands and thousands and thousands of times, times on end. Okay. Because when myosin tilts and pulls the actin, one myosin molecule. It only moves the actin just this tiny, tiny micrometer level amount of things. So you have to do it thousands and thousands of times. Okay. Very good. Why are cross bridges important? It's going to come back to, again, kind of the idea behind what's going to happen. And we, if we're going to use motor unit recruitment to get more or fewer cross bridges, what is it that the cross bridge is controlled for? I was going to say they generate force. Yes, very good. They generate force. I'm going to write this on the chalkboard. All of this, okay? Cross bridges equal force. That's the thing, okay? To move, we need force. So to move, we need cross bridges. More force, more cross bridges. Therefore, by the transitive deductive reasoning properties, I had a class when I was an undergrad that was called, what was it called? It was introductive introduction to philosophical questioning. I went to a liberal arts school. We all did take philosophy and religion and history, take all these different, all these kinds of things. And but the, the class was about philosophy and talking about inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning and I've forgotten most of it because I was 19 and it was early in the morning and I cared much more so about, I don't know, anything else other than that class on that particular day. But if more cross bridges equals more force, okay, and I have a bigger muscle, I can get more force, right? Because I have more cross bridges. So cross bridges come from actin and myosin. So if I have more actin and myosin because the muscle is bigger, and that's going to be that. Okay. Now, 
within something. We talked about this a little bit the other day. This is going to lead us into what we're going to do today. Okay. All of you have muscles. They are of a certain size, a certain shape. They have a certain pination angle, right? They originate and insert at certain very specific anatomical places that are going to slightly differ between all of you. I guess it would be among all of you. Okay. Now, let me, let me just pick some. Run me of your name. I'm sorry. I keep forgetting to bring things for y'all to make names. You are Julianne. Okay. Julianne, I want you to pick up your phone and hold it over your head. Okay. Anybody remember from anatomy what muscle is she using or muscles is she using to put her arm up like this? You all have to help me because I certainly don't know. Probably, probably a deltoid or something, right? Sort of push. Yes, my man's nodding his head. Okay. I'm relying on you guys. I've never so we did this. Okay. Now, can you take your uh, can you take your surface tablet and hold it kind of up with one hand, please? Okay, good. Put that down. Okay. How heavy is your backpack? Is your backpack heavy enough that you can hold it up with one hand? Can you try fortunately. Ooh, yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Now, can you all will be lawyers? Can you all stipulate for me that her her deltoid didn't get any bigger? She didn't gain any muscle. She didn't gain any actin and myosin in that small window of time between holding her phone, her tablet, and her backpack over her head. You all agree with me that that's a reasonable thing? Yes? Okay. So, how was she able to generate from the same muscle with the same amount of actinomyosin, a little bit of force, right? Her phone's not super heavy, a little bit of force, more force, maybe we'll call it kind of an in-between force to hold her laptop and then it looked i don't we don't want to make any assessments on how strong you are Julian, but it looked like that was reasonably difficult for you to hold your backpack you probably have many large books and things that are you know in there on all of that right it probably wasn't your max but it was we were getting how do we get different amounts of force so we're getting different amounts of cross bridges to generate very distinct differences in gradations in force from the same muscle that has the same amount of active amounts that's never changed. That's right. Thank you. I've read the room very well. Motor unit recruitment. Okay. So what we do with the nervous system, all of you have muscles that are a certain size. That in many ways sets a range. Okay. You can generate this much force based upon the size of your muscle based upon the total number of cross bridges that you have the potential to form. Okay. When you need a little bit of force, all that you do in that muscle is you just form just enough cross bridges, just turn on enough muscle fibers to get that amount of force. Even though we have some in reserve, do just enough. Then when you need more, Let's turn on some more and we'll get some more cross bridges and we work our way up on sort of that long continuum. Okay, so if you imagine that force production is going to go from zero to like a hundred percent for a given muscle, you're in this range, right? The cell phone is here, so the laptop was here and the bag was up there. We move ourselves within this range by changing motor unit recruitment. Your brain makes a very, very accurate guess, I see my said, at how much, if I want to lift my phone and do a certain thing, it's going to make a guess at where along this continuum we need to be in order to perform that particular task. And so then the brain says, okay, turn on just enough motor neurons to activate just enough sarcomeres or actinomyosin and cross bridges to get me that precise amount of force, okay? You don't need all of it, do just enough. Well, now we need more, turn more on. Oh, I've been holding this thing for a while. Some of these are starting to fatigue, shut them off, turn some other ones off. So we're gonna use the nervous system to manipulate 
how much of your muscle is quote unquote on at a given time. Okay? Does that as a concept make sense to you guys? Does it make sense? Because if it doesn't, we need to spend more, I need to do more analogies because this is really, really important. Okay. This is the foundation in some ways of all voluntary movements. Your ability to walk and run and jump and whatever it is that you're doing all comes back to this. Okay. Asking a question. Yes. Okay. So I don't have very much muscle. Same as in my arms. Okay. Definitely have like more muscle in your arms than I do. That's a that's a wildly speculative kind of concept. No, it's like, it's so. just a fact. Okay. Um, but anyway. So the number of cross bridges that you would need to form to lift your thumb versus how many I would need to lift my thumb, would that be like relatively the same? Yes, that's a great question. Your phone weighs whatever it weighs. Why does it weigh that? Why does your phone weigh however much it weighs? Gravity. Gravity, right? Gravity is the same. If we go up on top of Mount Everest, we can make it a little bit less right but your phone has a certain mass gravity acts on that mass and you get right gravity is exerting a force to pick it up you have to generate just enough force to overcome the pull of gravity to be able to move you guys stand up you're overcoming the force of gravity to stand up to walk you're overcoming the force of gravity wanting to hold you in the same spot so if the phone weighs the same, it takes the same amount of force for both of us, Madison, to be able to pick this up. Okay. But if I have more muscle, or as we will see, I may have the same muscle as you, but because of training and things, I am better able to get into this region out here. Okay. Then I may be able to pick up even heavier objects than you. But if you have less muscle than me, then the phone may be here for you while it's here for me. Okay, does that make sense? That's a really, that's a really good kind of contextualizing question. And that will become important when we talk about adaptations to training and why we have to normalize strength and normalize training intensity to whatever this number out here is, which may be different for everybody. Okay. Good questions. So when we want to turn a muscle on, you never think about this, right? You think and we picked up your bag, you aren't thinking, okay, I need 17 motor units to do this. So that I can get 3,000 cross bridges. Like you don't think about moving and doing things in that. Okay. The nervous system just does it because you've been doing this for you know 20 or 21, or in my instance, too many more years than that. It just learns and it knows. It estimates the brain weighs about this much. So let's do that. And what it does is it, it sends enough of a signal, it turns on one motor unit. And then that motor unit is not going to get us enough cross bridges to pick it up. So then it does a second one and a third one and a fourth one, okay, until we have enough to pick this up. It goes in that kind of very distinct manner, but they're just basically right on top of each other. It's like one, two, three, four, just boom. You get them all kind of at once, even if it's slightly, a little slight bit of time delay, because your brain learns. All right, well, I need this much to get this. We did this five seconds ago. Do it again. And it just it turns it off. Okay. This is where practicing things becomes important. You guys have learned throughout your life. You guys ever picked up a box you thought had stuff in it was going to be heavy and it was empty? You generate way more force than you need. You fly over backwards. Okay. That's where we have this mismatch between what I'm guessing is that I need versus what we're actually going to have. Okay. Also remember that motor units come in different sizes. And that size is also going to be dependent upon or, or help us determine the fiber type of the muscle that are going to be innervated by that motor neuron, okay? So we turn on motor units through something called the Hinneman size principle, okay? The Hinneman size principle. We turn on the smallest motor units first. 
The motor units that have the fewest number of fibers in them are the ones that get turned on first. Okay. Those also tend to be the motor units that innervate slow twitch or type one muscle fibers. Okay. And talk about why that is an advantage. So if you look at this kind of rough graph, so this has exercise intensity as a percentage, what we're calling aerobic intensity, but imagine this is maximal strength or maximal kind of force production out here at 100, basically none, down here at zero. And what this is illustrating is the total percentage of muscle fibers in a muscle that are active or recruited as it relates to the intensity or as we get closer and closer to your maximal strength. So what you will note is here, if you have gotten one or two motor units turned off, they are type one, they are slow twitch motor units. As I need more and more force, I turn on more and more of those motor units. At some point, I'm going to then start having to turn on two A's, and then at some point, I'm going to have to start turning on two X's if I have them. In order to get to 100% of maximal strength, I have to turn these on, leave them on. They're going to stay on and start adding more. These stay on until eventually I get out here and I've got nothing left and all of those motor units are recruited for a day muscle. That scenario doesn't happen very often in most people. Okay? Unless you are very highly trained at a specific activity, it is difficult for you to recruit a hundred percent of the muscle fibers in a particular muscle. All right. If you play a sport, if you lift weights, if you do something that's very high force a lot, you can probably get pretty close. We get closer in our arms because our arms tend to be smaller than our legs doing daily activities, but this is pretty rare. Okay. But this is how this thing operates. Okay. And so the brain says, I need this much force, boom, 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 firing up through here. And that takes fractions of a second for us to get there. Okay. All right. Now, please don't make fun of my artwork. Okay. I was very proud of myself when I did this, um, trying to do this in, in PowerPoint. So what I'm going to try to show you now is this is the same thing that was just there, but I want you to see here's our muscle. Our big circle is our whole muscle. Okay. And I'm going to show you when I need a little bit of force, when I initially turn a muscle on, Okay, I turn on one motor unit, and here are the fibers that are connected to that motor unit. Okay, and so you will note that they are dispersed somewhat randomly across the whole muscle, and they are slow twitch or type one muscle fibers. Right? That's not enough force to do whatever task I want, so I turn on a second motor unit. That motor unit has a few more fibers in it. I'm going to get a little bit more force. I'm starting to move my way up this red line. I need more and more force. I need more and more motor units. And so eventually, if the force is enough, I do a third motor unit. Eventually, I get to a place where I'm doing type 2A fibers. Okay. Now, I realize this was after I had made all of this, and I've just been too lazy to go back and, and fix it that you will note that the two A fibers are a little bigger than the one fibers. And you will also note that in this one motor unit, there's actually not more of these blue fibers than the last of the type one. There should have been more. This is a bigger motor unit. It's got more fibers. But you just work your way up in this way, slowly, slowly, until eventually you get to the two X's. And then you would just work your way up, adding more and more of these fibers. And so eventually everything in here has been turned off. Okay if you need it okay now in actual practice let's say this was where you were this got me enough to pick up my back okay but i've got to now i'm, I'm working out or i'm doing something I'm, I'm doing a sport and i have to keep picking my bag up over and over and over again and what will happen is that eventually some of these fibers will fatigue and so some of them will drop off, okay, or not work. And so in some instances, then I have to start doing this in order to be able to just lift my back, 
That's some fibrous fatigue. I have to recruit more muscle to generate that same force. And we'll talk about that. That will become important later on today when we talk about how we train. Okay. Any questions? Does that make sense, guys? Okay. So, why is it good that I recruit slow twitch motor units that have very few fibers in them first? I don't think that's good. You fatigue slowly. You fatigue slowly. Okay. Okay. You guys are all breathing, right? If I ask you to breathe more deeply and more forcefully, could you do that? But you breathe all the time, and then you think about it, okay? You walk all the time, and you don't think about it. Low force contractions happen a lot, okay? A lot. Life depends upon low force diaphragmatic contractions so that you can breathe. High blood fibers are very resistant to fatigue. So, if you're going to have to pick some to get recruited first, which means the smallest, slowest motor units get turned on for every activity that involves a particular muscle group. Okay. Anything that you do that looks like a curl or involves contraction of your bicep, those smallest, slowest motor units are always getting turned on no matter what is happening. Okay. So it's useful that those units that get used the most are the most resistant to fatigue, okay? We have removed a lot of the natural selective pressure from our lives because of all of this, but imagine a scenario way back in the day that I need to be able to do that and have those fibers not be fatigued so I can run away from something so it doesn't eat me, right? Or I've been shooting a bow and arrow all day and I'm starting to get tired. I don't want those because if I can't pull the bow and arrow back, then maybe I can't shoot something I don't need to eat today, okay? So, that's the good part about all of that. There's another thing that's good, though. Another thing, okay? Something else that's really, really important. Don't you do it like what you used to max like? Yeah. Many of you are, many of you are, are typing, but usually you're right on your, on your tablet, right? Is that it's a pretty delicate little thing that you're doing. You guys think about how you ever try to write, you ever watch a toddler try to use a crayon or a pen, like my daughter does, just grinds the thing in there. Okay. Very delicate. Anybody play the guitar or play like the violin or, or something, right? All of those little tiny, very fine motor skill finger placement movements and things. Okay. We do a lot of things that give us what we call fine motor skills. Writing is a fine motor skill. Okay, playing instruments are fine motor skills. Okay, these very tiny gradations in force, very precise, that give us lots of control. Okay? It's one of the things that separates us from some lower animals. Okay, you know, like my dogs don't have control in their toes and things to be able to hold an instrument or do whatever they're going to do. When you put stuff in their mouth, they can do a lot of kind of cool things but they can't manipulate stuff in the way that we can, okay? A lot of that comes from having these small, slow motor units early on. What it does is it gives us the ability to generate very small, but finely gradated and precise increments in force on the low end, okay? On the low end of total force production. Because they're small, when you return the second one on, you get just a little bit more force, just a little bit. And then you get a third, you get just a little bit more, as opposed to when you turn on that very last, very large type 2X motor unit, you might get 5% of your total force out of that one last motor unit. And that 5% means that Hensley has now smashed her stylus into her tablet and she's very sad because she's broken. Okay. You can't paint, you can't draw, you can't play the guitar. If that was how we do things. Okay. You all will see later on in the course, one of the consequences of aging is that you begin to lose some of the, your small motor units become bigger. And because of that, you lose some fine motor skills. You lose some ability because when you turn it on, they all get turned off. 
And so you, you become jerkier with your movements, you, you lose kind of fine motor strength. Okay. So the way this is all set up is sort of very, we are very well adapted in the way that we live and that this allows us to do things that are very sort of indicative of human behavior that make it different than other things. Okay. As a good question. I was going to say that art or art. Like doing makeup would be impossible if we didn't. Okay. <laughs> okay. My only experience with doing makeup is that my daughter likes to try to like put powder on me in the mornings. My wife will be doing her makeup and things and my daughter goes and we have she has her own makeup brushes lots of times she just likes to dunk them in the water and then like think treat them like paint brushes and things my wife gave her like an old powder thing and she comes and she tries to put powder on daddy and i'm just like great this is lovely whatever but yes i can imagine that that would be would very much be the case but you can pick you know anything like all of that okay are going to be are going to be things that are going to be there okay so I told you one way that the nervous system plays a role in controlling force production, okay? It controls how many motor units, how many muscle fibers are on at a given time, okay? That's not the full story though. That's not the full story. It's more complicated than that. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit of insight into this and then leave the rest for Dr. Mike and exercise space, okay? So, we teach entire PhD level classes talking about these two things that we've just covered. We can spend an entire course just talking about all the ins and outs of this. But there is another thing, all right? A motor unit that is turned on, not all activated or recruited motor units are on to the same extent, okay? So think about that. Imagine that the lights in here are motor units. All right, and we have one, two, three, six, nine, we would have like 12 light switches. Every light represents one motor, okay? Recruitment lets us turn the switch on to turn all each individual light on, okay? Well, once it's on, imagine that it has a dimmer switch, okay? So when you turn a motor unit on, it initially comes on and it's very dim, and we have the ability by manipulating something called firing frequency, okay, which is the number of action potentials sent from the brain to that motor unit in a given period of time. Usually we just make it one second, okay? How many action potentials do we get in a given second? We have an ability within a range to sort of dim or brighten the light that is our motor, unit, okay? And so what I'm showing you guys here is something called the force frequency relationship. Now, this was derived from a whole muscle, but the concept and the idea works on an individual muscle fiber level. So if you look at the stimulus frequency, this is, to make this easy, imagine this is the number of action potentials being sent to the motor neuron in one second, okay? So we measure frequency in something called Hertz for any of you guys that have had physics too, right? Anybody had physics too? A couple of you guys, it's terrible, right? Electricity, everything works backwards, magnets are awful. My college roommate was an engineer, he loved physics, and he would always make fun of us and be like, well, it's a lot easier if you just use calculus and do all this. And I'm like, shut up, I've not had four classes of calculus. But we measure electricity, we measure frequency in Hertz, okay? All hertz are just think of it as action potentials in a given set. Okay. When we initially turn on a motor unit, the firing frequency is very low. One, two, three action potentials per second. That gets us a certain amount of force out of those muscle fibers that are on. Okay. So imagine every time there's an action potential through the motor neuron, we get release of acetylcholine, we get release of calcium we get cross breakers, okay? As we increase the number of action potentials, you will know that there begins to become this additive effect where as this goes up, the amount of force production that we get also goes up to some maximal rate. In this particular person, that maximal rate is somewhere around 50 action potentials per second. You can make it all the way up to 70, and you're not really getting any more force. So there is a max firing rate that we can do all of this. 
Okay. So the way the nervous system works is it says turn on a motor unit, drive that motor unit at a given firing rate that gets us a certain amount of force. Turn on a second motor unit, drive it at a certain firing frequency, and then together that gives us a certain a certain amount of force, so on and so forth. Okay. So as motor units get turned on, they start off firing very low, and then we gradually increase the firing rate. And when doing that gets us close to the top, or if it doesn't get us the amount of force that we want, then we turn on a second, another motor unit, and another one, and another. So there's this sort of loop of things that, that do this, okay? All right. When you look at this, and I apologize, this is, you guys probably, you ever played an Atari, and you know what an Atari was? This was like the original sort of PlayStation. It was like literally like dots and lines and things, okay? There's an Atari game called Missile Commander. And this graph reminds me of what we would do when we played Missile Commander about 20 years before the old war. When I was when I was a little little kid, but Google Missile Commander it wouldn't make sense. What you see here, okay, each line on this graph represents one motor unit. Okay, it represents one motor unit. Each dot along the line represents a point in time when we measured the firing rate of that motor unit. And what they did. This is done from a technique called electromyography. Now, you guys used EMG in physiology class, right? You put electrodes on your muscle and you contracted them, and you could measure the electricity, the action potentials that are kind of, you can see what's happening. This is done through something called needle EMG. You take these little tiny fine wires, and this is usually done in the small muscles of the hand, and they jab them in, okay? And they have you, this is probably done from the FDI muscle. So they're using the first dorsal interosseous and they're moving their index finger out away from, from all of this. So on the far left is the smallest amount of force you can get like trying to move your finger out. And then on the far right is they contract out as hard as you possibly can. And they, they jab, I don't know, that's like 70 needles in there. Every, they have as many needles as they have as they have lines. Right? What they do is they, the needles are so small that they can locationally move them around and get a reading from one motor unit per needle. And that lets us then figure out is it on? And then once it is on, what is the frequency of action potentials in the midst of all of that? I had needle EMG done to my leg about a month ago from a neurologist in Oklahoma City. I have this weird, and it's going away now, but I had this like, weird pain where if you touch, if you touch my ankle right out here, you know, I would get this weird shooting pain up my TA. And we could never figure out like moving, nothing bothered it other than just barely like my pants brushing it. It was really annoying to try to sleep. And I went and they were checking me for nerve function to see if I had a neuropathy or some other kind of unexplainable thing. They did this by, they would stick the needles in and they would move them around and have me contract. And they were checking, they checked all the way up to see if I was, if I had good motor function, which of course I did um, on, on these kinds of things. You can do this in a lot. Okay. So what I think is, this is my favorite graph in all of neurophysiology. Okay. And it's from like 1980. The first author's last name is Monster. So I was telling my students, like, remember the Monster graph? I don't know why that seems very sort of dad jokey, but I like that. And what I think it illustrates is this is the neural strategy for how we arrive at any given amount of force that we need to perform a certain task. Okay. I need a little bit of force. I recruit one motor unit. I fire it at a low rate. If I need a little bit more force, the first thing I do is increase firing rate in that motor unit. At some point, that ceases to be enough to get me the force that I want, so I recruit a second unit. But at that point, this unit is firing at 16 hertz. My second one is only firing at, at eight. This one stays, it goes up, so then I start increasing firing rate. My second one, that gets me a little bit more force, so on and so forth. This is the pattern where we turn one on, increase firing rate, turn another one on, increase firing rate, and However much force you generate, 
is the net total of firing rate and total number of motor units that are turned on at that given period of time. And at some point, you turn on all of the units and you drive all of them at the highest possible firing rate, and then you're out of force. That's all the force that you can get. Okay. So when you go try to lift something that's super duper heavy, this is what it is that you're doing. You never think about this. It happens almost instantaneously, okay? But there is a huge amount of complexity and precision that we are able to generate by the way the motor cortex signals to the alpha motor neurons and how those things then signal down to our individual muscle fibers, okay? And it's that part, why you don't have to think about it, why the brain sends things and the spinal cord modulates a whole bunch of stuff to make this pattern happen. That's the stuff we talk about in the pH two level classes and those kinds of things. And how that changes with training, how it changes with detraining, how it changes if you have peripheral nerve injuries, all of these other questions. But this is the general gist of what's going on. I'm not going to ask you about this. Okay. You're not going to have to recreate this on a test or anything. But I think to me, it visually demonstrates. The strategy that the nervous system uses to help us get force. Okay? And I hope that makes some level of sense to you guys. Now, when you're riding or when you're running or you're lifting legs or you're jumping or dancing or whatever it is that you're doing, maybe you think about what's going on in a manner that kind of looks like this. Okay? Questions? Clear as mud? It's one of my old professors used to say. Uh, does the end of each line on there seem a bunch of feet, or is that just maximal? It's maximal firing rate or force in that individual motor unit. Weirdly, what happens when a given motor unit begins to fatigue is its firing rate actually drops and then it falls out. It doesn't get turned on anymore. Probably with people, when you get near, we will call fatigue task failure, like you can't do anything anymore. You're going to be, it's going to look like this thing out here. And then all of a sudden, with all of these things on, it's not that I can't get 10 newtons of force, I now can't get eight or something, right? It all kind of gets shifted to the left. And then you can't do the thing you were wanting to do anymore, even though you sort of turned all of them on and you're driving them all as much as you possibly can. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. of course. Okay, now, as if how we get force in practice wasn't complicated enough by what the nervous system does. Once you start moving, we also have to consider a couple of other variables that go into this. And these have really, really important implications for athletic performance, okay? And for how we train in general, just for health, but especially for athletic performance. What I am showing you guys here is the relationship between contraction velocity and your ability to generate force. This is called a force velocity curve, okay? So what you can see, and this is a, a thing that was made out of individual, this is probably from an animal, from 1950 here, is force is on the x-axis on the bottom. And speed or velocity is up and down on the y axis. And so, what you see is here is a very, very fast contraction. Here, down here on the bottom, this is a very, very slow contraction. Okay. And there is this hyperbolic relationship, but in general, what we see is the faster you want a muscle to contract, so the faster you want to run or move the less force any recruited and activated muscle fiber is going to be able to generate. Okay? So going fast, you don't get as much force. And you guys had a class where you had to measure your maximal strength, like your personal training, where you had a lab. We'll do it in here, sort of, right? You can lift something very, very heavy, the most weight that you can lift. Okay. In a non-super creepy way, go to the Huff today and watch the bros do whatever they're doing. It's Wednesday. Because you get the same jokes in multiple classes in a row. What are the bros lifting? What are we lifting today? Ladies, y'all can do bros too. It's okay. What are we, what are we doing? Is it 
probably not second bench day, but is it, is it, is it back and buys today? Is it shoulders? I know people back and buys today. Back and buys today? Okay, that's a good last class. So, you know, whatever we're doing, if they're lifting very heavy, go watch the bros. Okay. They're not moving the weight very fast because they can't mechanically to lift something that is near your maximal strength, you can't move it very fast. Okay. You can't move it very fast. Just imagine you're going to do curls with your phone. You can go really fast. Or I got to do curls with, I could put multiple books in here and it's all I can do to kind of pick this up and make it, it's gonna go much slower, okay? There are some mechanical properties of the cross bridge cycle that influence why the relationship looks this way. I should tell you, okay, I should tell you, what you see is strictly for concentric contractions. A shortening contraction, when you go fast, you get less force. Anybody want to guess on this graph, if I told you to pick out the point on the graph where an isometric contraction takes place, could you come pick it out? It's on there. Where on this graph is an isometric contraction? Ooh, yes. So there's here. No velocity. If I'm not moving and it's not shortening, there's no velocity. Very good. Remind me of your name? Megan. Megan. Megan's exactly right. Okay. This is an isometric contraction because there's no movement, there's no velocity. So in essence, an isometric contraction is the slowest possible contraction that you can do because you never move. So you get the most force, which means our bros can hold when they do curls, they can hold more weight right here in an isometric contraction than they can pick up, than they can do shortening things, okay? Because of the mechanics of how all of this works. So why is this the case? I'll tell you why, and then we'll talk about eccentric contractions, which are just a giant fucking mess, okay? And make everything different, but they're kind of cool. Why does this happen, okay? Where do I get shortening in a muscle? Where does the movement come from? What was the first thing we talked about today? Cross bridges. I have to have, I think it was, someone said a power stroke, right? To get a concentric contraction, you have to have a power stroke, okay? If I wanna have a very fast concentric contraction, I have to have many, many, many power strokes going consecutively. Well, I get one power stroke, what has to happen for me to get a second power stroke from that same myosin molecule? It has to relax. Good. If it's relaxed, what can it not do? If it's relaxed, it's not a cross bridge anymore, right? So there's no force. So when you do very fast contraction, the cross bridge cycle is happening so rapidly and so often that at any instant in time, okay, any instant in time, there's less cross bridges that are formed because they're all having to break over and over again. There's less that are formed. And it's only the ones that are currently formed that give us the force, okay? So to go fast, you have to continually relax the muscle to keep moving. And so instantaneously, there's fewer ones that are on there. Therefore, I get less force. When you go slower, there's less sort of a time it's, you don't, you have more time for them to hold on and stay attached and generate force. And then a few can break and then reattach and we can, we're going much, much slower. So more of them can stay attached to them, okay? That's probably kind of an advanced sort of concept in some ways, but does it kind of make sense to you guys? 
So again, when I told you guys that movement and the relationship between how much force we get, it all comes back to the mechanics of how the cross spring cycle works. And that's why I want you guys to know it and to memorize it because it all comes back to that. You can trace everything back to those kinds of things. Okay? So in an isometric contraction, why am I getting more force? During an isometric contraction, why am I getting more force? Then any contraction that involves any sort of movement and shortening that's going to get me less than an isometric contraction. Where does the force come from? Always think about it, go back to the force. Where does the force come? Now we're in the Star Wars movie. Right? Where does the force come from? Cross bridges. So if I have a contraction that gets me more force, what can we reasonably assume about my cross bridges? There are more cross bridges? Yes, there are more cross bridges. If I'm not moving, I don't have to detach the cross bridges. I don't have to use the ATP to break them, to move them back so I can keep moving. Therefore, I get more force isometric because they're always attached. Or they're attached more often. I also don't use as much energy isometrically because they're never being broken. So I use less energy. Okay. Good. Now, oh, eccentric contractions. Let me tell you. If I told you that when you do an eccentric contraction and you go fast, you get just as much force as you do when you go slow, sometimes more, would that surprise you? Madison is surprised. So like you could, we'll go back to our bros doing curls, okay? Go back to our bros doing curls. I'm gonna curl this. Somebody give me, somebody have a heavier backpack? Relatively heavy backpack? They didn't have to be very heavy, I'm not that strong. Anybody got some books in your backpack, anything? No, I was like, no, whatever, that's fine. It's okay, it's fine, it's fine. I'm doing this, I can go this fast, up with my back, okay? Imagine that it's going, this is all that I can do is go this speed. But if I want to lower it down, I can go really fast. The faster I go trying to lower it down, I don't lose any ability to generate force, okay? You can give me a very, very heavy weight that the pickup goes about this speed, but when I lower it down, it can go as fast as I want to, okay? It's still under control. Eccentric contractions, in general, force production is independent of velocity. It's independent of velocity. So I'll show you this graph. And what I want you to understand with this one is we flipped the axes. Now velocity is on the bottom and force is on the Y. This line in the middle represents an isometric contraction because it's at zero velocity. This is accelerating, so this is a concentric contraction here. Velocity is increasing in the positive direction, so this is faster and faster shortening, isometric, fast shortening, force drops. Here is, on the left side, here's an eccentric contraction going faster and faster, lengthening, going in the negative direction. And force goes up a little bit, that's the opposite, goes up a little bit, and then it's basically level and flat over time as I go faster and faster. Okay. Eccentric contractions are independent of velocity. Okay. Again, why is this? It's all about the cross bridges. Like with isometric contractions, when I do an eccentric contraction, I don't have to break the cross bridges down. Okay. I just attach, I do the cross bridge cycle basically once. They attach, they're hooked on, I get force. And then here we go. And they just get limited. Okay. Technically, what happens with these central contractions is gravity is trying to pull something down. And so what you do is you generate just a tiny, tiny fraction amount of force less than whatever gravity is using. And that lets gravity pull it down. So you're just kind of hanging on and you're just going just a little bit under whatever you need. And that lets it fall. 
is there's kind of a controlled fall going down. Okay. So again, just important to under to kind of understand these things. Constantly, when I go fast, I get less force. Okay. So when I want to be a sprinter and I want to run fast, I'm getting less force. Right. That's not that close to my maximal force production. So I need to train in a way that I can generate a lot of force out of those muscles that I use to sprint, which means then when I'm trying to run fast, I'm going to lose a little bit less off of my top end goes up, so everything kind of gets shifted. Okay. That's kind of what's going to go down. Okay, so that's kind of what's happening there. I'm doing on time. Here's the thing called muscle power. You ever heard of the word power? Anybody in biomechanics? No. A couple of you guys did say you had physics, yeah? Show of hands. Anybody have physics? Okay. The two of you guys, y'all talk about power and physics. Okay. Power is force multiplied by velocity. Okay. That's what it is. If you want to be a good athlete for a lot of sports, maybe not curling. Okay. Anybody watch the crazy like scheme where they go off the big the one hill and they do all the freaking tricks in the air? Yes, big air is whatever it is that they call it. That, that shit is wild. Um, I'm very impressed. There's no way I would ever be brave enough to do any of those things um, on, on those kinds of things. Um, that maybe not. So if you want to run fast and jump high in things, you need to be able to generate a lot of power. Power is the application of force at a given speed. So more power means you can push against gravity to a greater extent at a faster rate, which gets you a higher jump, a higher sprint speed. You can change direction from one way to the other faster if you're playing basketball or soccer or badminton or whatever it is that you're going that you're going to be able to do. I don't know what other sports people like to like to play. If you play ultimate frisbee or volleyball or whatever it is that you're doing. Power is important, okay? And it kind of looks like this, where the x-axis is velocity, the y-axis is force. And so mathematically, optimum power comes at about a third of maximal velocity, okay? And about a third of maximal velocity. So at your max sprint speed is going to correspond probably close to where your max power is. And so you're contracting your muscles at about a third of their, of their maximum velocity. And that's going to get us some that's kind of mathematically how all of that begins to work out. You guys will see, we'll talk a little bit about training. I can train to make my power go up. I can train to allow myself to generate more power and therefore run faster, jump higher, change directions better. And I can do that either by making my overall force production go up, more force, more power, or I can work on my ability to get more force at a given velocity, which we'll talk a little bit about. Probably not today, but later on in class. Okay. But this is just kind of this, this power relationship that is, that is really important. There are specific exercises. Okay. Well, again, we'll knock on the bros. The bros today are bench pressing, they're doing curls, they're doing some shoulder press. They're probably working their calves, but not their quads, right? Looking, we got like a month until spring break. They're probably thinking about doing some crunches or something like all of that. What they're not doing are power exercises. They're not doing a power clean. They're not doing plyometric exercises where you jump up on a box and jump down. They're not training their nervous system. The nervous system and motor unit recruitment determines a lot of this velocity stuff. So you have to practice going fast to get better at going fast. So you do lifts in a way where you try to you try to lift something very quickly and very powerful. Okay. So we'll we'll talk more about that later. All right, questions, comments, concerns. Okay. Let's take a five-minute break and then we will start talking about adaptations to resistance training. Okay. Adaptations to resistance training. We have got five. Doing. 
So now that we have some idea about how skill it almost works, okay, we're going to talk about once I start doing a particular exercise protocol, specifically resistance training, how is the underlying anatomy and physiology of skeletal muscle going to change? Okay, how's all the background to change? So I try to present this in as sort of clear a way as possible, but I want you all to know that what I'm going to tell you guys today and next week and through this particular class, this is not comprehensive. This is not a, this is not everything that we know about resistance training. This is not all of the individual signals that make certain things change. Um, it's just kind of an introductory overview to get everybody all in, on the same page. Okay. So show of hands, all right. How many of you have ever done for any consistent period of time resistance training? Have you done weightlifting or something where you were doing like stuff with body weight, like anything you think would look like resistance training? Okay, so like three quarters of you guys. Okay. Why did you do that? Let's let's ask that question. Is it an eraser somewhere? Why do we why did you do that? Somebody just tell me. A reason why you did that. Okay. Kenzie, what was your, let me, let me rephrase the question. What was your goal in doing that? Or what was the goal of the people that were making you do it? As the son of a football coach, there was not a lot of choice in the, we are going to power clean today and squat today. So um, what, what was the goal? What were you trying to achieve? Okay. Wanted to jump higher. Okay. What else? Anybody else? What were your goals? Why were you doing? Get stronger. Stronger. All right. More force. As we just talked about, if Kinsey wants to jump higher, she probably needs to generate more force. Or, or you need to lower your body mass at the same force so you can generate more. You have less of gravity to push it. Well, gravity is the same. You have less mass on which gravity is acting to push it. Yes, that's right. So more force. Okay. Thank you. I just don't like running as much. You don't like running as much. So your goal was just, I'm not running. Okay. When you say I wanted to get in shape, what, what do you like? What does that mean to you? If you say I want to be in shape, is that stronger? Is that I'm jumping higher? What, is, what does that look like? It lowers metabolism. Are we sure it lowers metabolism? It does. It raises metabolism. Why does it raise metabolism? It does, yes. What what changes that lets your metabolic rate go up? Your muscle mass. My muscle mass. Okay. Nobody wants to say this, probably. We get bigger muscles, right? It's very vain, maybe, to say, and you just want the bigger muscles because you want to be stronger. It's not because. It's going to be spring break and I want to look in a particular way or something, right? Get bigger muscles. Okay. What'd you do? If I want to get stronger. What do I have to get better at doing? How do I get more force? Forming cross bridges. Okay. Well, how do I form more cross bridges, Madison? Okay, now you're talking about sort of recycling and doing the cross bridge, detaching and reattaching. It's a slightly, it's close, but it's a slightly different kind of thing, right? If I want more cross bridges, how do I get them? 
I recruit more. Okay, good. It's one way. Exercise. So, but what is that? How does that get me more prosperous? Like I'm, I'm on, a, on a physiological or an anatomical level, how do I increase the number of cross bridges I can instantaneously pull up? I can change recruit, I can get better turning on the muscle that I have, or what? Get more muscle. Increase the size of my muscle. Okay. So. Then we get into the idea of I want to be in better shape or I want to be healthier or whatever that might that might look like. Okay. But the general goals of resistance training are, right? We're going to call this muscular fitness. We'll talk about that next week, how we assess it. But generally, muscular fitness is just a measure of how strong you are. And the thought is if I am stronger, and I will show you all stuff that will blow your mind. Your grip strength will predict when you die. Guess what we're going to measure in class? Your grip strength. Okay. Um, Y'all are not old enough that it, really, that it really matters in some ways. But we can use your strength in certain muscle groups to predict when you're going to die. To predict your ability to not have high blood pressure or not have type two diabetes or certain things, okay? When I ask you, why should you do this? This is one of the, this is the second piece of our physical activity recommendations, okay? All of you that are not getting two days or all of us, I'm gonna raise my hand here. All of us that are not getting two days of some form of total body resistance training per week are not meeting the optimum activity guidelines to maximize our health, okay? Being strong is good, okay? Being strong is good. So we'll talk about some of, some of the hows and the whys of what's gonna happen. When you went to resistance training, anybody that's been, what did you do? Describe for me what you did. Squats. Okay, you're gonna do a squat. So, like, how many times did you squat? How much weight did you use when you squatted? How many sets? How many reps? And what? What did you? What were you doing? What was your kind of goal when you went to do that? Um, I mean, some days we do like four reps, which is a three by four. Okay. Yeah, you know, three by two or something. And some days we do like higher reps, so like three by twelve or three by sixteen. So okay. Okay. And how much weight did you lift in each one of those? How did that change? It was a lot longer when you're going to our reps. Like we were trying to, every time you're trying to do, it was supposed to involve a lot of effort. A lot of effort, okay. So, and we'll get more into this next week. But when we undertake resistance training, we typically use terms like this. And I'm sure most of you have. heard most of these, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page, okay? When you do resistance training, you have a certain weight that you're going to lift. It might be your body weight. It might be some external, I have a dumbbell or a barbell or something. That's the weight. If force production tells us our intensity, to lift a heavier weight, I have to be at a higher intensity. So weight lifted is our sort of intensity measure. The number of times that you are performing that lift or that contraction, that's what reps are. You do a certain number of reps and then you stop and maybe you rest and then you come back and you do it again. Those are called sets, okay? So if you're doing like three by four, it would be three sets of four reps and then you would have some weight, like let's just say a hundred pounds. Okay. Then maybe you're going to do three sets of 12 reps. And rather than doing 100 pounds, you're going to do 80 pounds or something like that. Okay. Does that kind of jive, right? Or I'm not doing this, I'm doing push ups. And I'm going to do my body weight on a push up and I'm going to do 20 reps and I'm going to do three sets of something like that. That's, that's kind of how, how all of that gets laid out. Okay.
Now, we will talk about, and I will harp on um, what people do a whole bunch on what is the optimum thing to do and how to configure all of this. The end, the end thing is it doesn't really fucking matter, okay? Doing it is way more important than, oh, it's three by four, or five by four, or two by 12. Yeah. Doing it's way more important for our adaptations, okay? If you wanna be stronger, you gotta go and lift. If you wanna get bigger muscles, you gotta go and lift, okay? That's way more important, but we'll, we'll spend some time talking talking our way through some of that stuff, okay? Now, when we care about the actual adaptation, okay? The things that drive being stronger, getting or accreting, the accretion of muscle, getting more active and myosin, so I have more cross -breeds. There are all of these things that go into all of this that we can relate back to right the contractions and the number of contractions and the mechanical things that are happening while we're doing this if the end goal is bigger muscles stronger muscles there's all of this stuff that happens that goes on you don't have to know all of this we'll point out a couple of them but there's this big interaction okay every time i lift something i generate an amount of force that involves my brain telling the muscles to generate force that involves the motor neurons firing, that involves signals down the axon, it involves signals across the neuromuscular junction, it involves calcium release, it involves actin and myosin, okay? It involves the use of ATP, okay? When those things happen, there is movement, there is shortening, there is lengthening, membranes get stretched, okay? There's all of this stuff that happens, there's metabolism that's going on. And there's a host of these things that interact with receptors in the central nervous system, patterns of muscle contraction and central nervous system activation, receptors in the nucleus of our muscle cells that are going to turn on or off certain processes and cause certain changes if you do it consistently over time. And there's this huge interaction of these things that we don't fully understand still. However many years later, you know, we're trying to understand and study this. 60, 70, 80 years later. Okay? But I'll give you guys some level of an overview of what this looks like. Okay? We'll also, hopefully, as we go through some of this, talk about some myths, this idea. If I ever hear any of you use the word tone, so helpful. Ladies, I'm going to pick on y'all for a minute. I don't want to get bulky. I want to be toned. I don't know what that means. Some of you have probably said that. I think you probably have friends that say that. Okay. Tone is not a thing. You can't train to be toned. You can diet, right? You can train and diet to have a certain appearance of your muscles, but there is no magic thing. Oh, I'm going to use these three pound pink dumbbells and I'm just going to do some curls. I see not any of you all, I'm sure. But when I go, I see it's mostly ladies with little light dumbbells. I do some curls, and I'm gonna do some shoulder press, and I'm gonna do this. It's meant to be a tricep kickback. It's only just gravity. I just drop it like all of this. I'm gonna do a light weight. I'm gonna lift it a bunch of times, and I'm gonna have long, lean muscles. Bullshit, all of it. Okay? Not a thing. Not a thing. Okay? Tone versus size. Not a thing. All right? Your cadavers had a lot of muscle tone, didn't they? Once you pulled the skin off and the subcutaneous fat off, they had a lot of muscle tone. What you think of as tone. Tone is just, I look lean and I have, I have not much fat over my muscle. Great. We, don't, we can't train that in a certain way for training versus size. Okay? If you want to have big muscles, you have to have good genetics. My guess is none of you have very good genetics. None of us have genetics for all of you. If we did, and you guys had already been resistance training, you'd be giant, okay? So high reps, low reps, eh, it doesn't really matter very much unless you really care about maximal strength in some ways. Machines versus free weights also doesn't matter. All of it works. It's fine. The idea of spot reduction, I'm going to do crunches. I'm going to get a six pack. No, you're not. Nope. Nope. Not at all. Y'all seen the people do this one, right? I'm doing this. Right? I'm working my love handles, you're making them bigger. Right? 
Got these big dumbbells and I'm doing this, you're increasing the size of your oblique muscles. You're not making your love handles smaller, you're making them bigger, okay? Spot reduction isn't a thing, much as my mom's, my mom hates this, right? She's, you know, my mom is almost 74 now. A little flabby tricep that waves at you a little bit, right? We probably all do, I got some too, we do all of this. Doing tricep kickbacks is not gonna magically make just the fat right there go away, okay? We add subcutaneous fat, we add muscle and things in our whole body. We can't just make it all go away in one place, okay? I don't know what we're doing. Don't go to abs class. You're just gonna have strong abs. That's great. It's not gonna be Muscle will turn into fat. No type one fibers versus type two fibers. There may be a little bit of that from a genetic standpoint. You have pretty good potential for both of them to grow similarly. And this idea, if I'm not sore, what's my workout effect? It doesn't matter. Well, that's not 100%. It mostly doesn't matter. If you're not sore after a workout, that's okay. I can make you sore after every workout if you, I can tell you how to do that if that's what you want. But recovery is really important. You really need to rest in between and recover and have time when you're not necessarily damaging your muscles. You have to have some break. And there's a little bit of a little bit of things in this thing. Okay, we'll talk about the magic of eccentric contractions a little bit later on. Okay, so there's going to be some myths that will bust along the way with this. Okay, so why do we resist this training? You guys, for the most part, got this, right? I want bigger muscles, I want stronger muscles, and I would like to be able to do some application of both of those things potentially to increase some sort of performance. Running, jumping, a particular sport, hitting a golf ball, whatever it's going to be. Okay, so we're going to cover... If this is what we want, how do we make that happen? What's the stimulus? Okay. What's the stimulus? What's the thing that drives all of that? When you go to the gym today, what do you need to do? If I tell you that sets and reps don't matter, then what should, what does matter from a stimulus standpoint to get this thing to happen? We'll talk a little bit about what it is that actually changes, right? Motor unit recruitment changes, firing rate may change, muscle size may change, and some things like that that are going to change. The stimulus consistently occurs, consistently drives some changes, and we'll talk about the mechanisms just very, very briefly. Okay? We have a class on advanced resistance training. If you really care about some more of these things, you guys can go and learn about all of the molecular signals, and there's a thing called mTOR, and all this other sort of stuff um, that, that drive a lot of all this. We'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. General things are going to be really important as we move ourselves across kind of putting all of this into application and, and trying to critique what people are actually doing that I want us to, to introduce now. And what they're doing. Okay. Adaptations, any change that you get, this is going to hold for running, cycling, resistance, whatever it is that you're doing, you're going to get better at doing exactly that, okay? If you want to get better at doing squats, you have to squat. If you want to get better, right, you want to get bigger muscles in your legs, then you need to do an exercise that actually uses those muscles and not other ones, okay? This is a concept called specificity. Adaptations to training are specific to the muscles you're using. And they are oftentimes relatively specific to getting better at doing the weight and number of repetitions that you've also done in a certain thing. So we can make use of, if we know what you wanna get better at, then we need to train in a way that is specifically going to target that thing that you want to do, okay? It, it targets that particular thing. The body adapts to the stress that's placed on. You guys are aware of something called homeostasis? What is homeostasis? <clears throat> Not even like, what is it? What's homeostasis? My body keeping myself alive. Okay. It's, that, that is in some ways determined. If you're not in homeostasis, that, that yes, that can, that can happen in Madison. What I mean, your name? Kara. Uh, Kara. Internal balance. Internal balance, okay, good, right? Stasis, balance, right? If you want things to change and adapt, you have to throw yourself out of homeostasis. Okay? 
You have to stress your internal system. It may not, or maybe it does, I don't know, maybe don't answer this question, but it may not seem like it to you guys right now. But when I was y'all's age, if you had told me that I would make a career out of talking in front of large-ish groups of people, I would have crawled under my desk and died, I think, right? I was terrified to talk in front of people. I was very like painfully shy. I just, I did not, this was you know, very, very not my thing. Yet this is what I do every day. And I think I do a reasonable job of it, okay? Why? When I started doing this, it freaked me out so badly, <laughs> right? And, but then over time, I'm out of homeostasis and it stresses me. And then the next time it becomes a little better and a little better and a little better and a little better. And then eventually you're like, you know what? With you guys, I don't get very stressed when I have to teach. I mean, put me in a different environment with other people and maybe it will still freak me out some. But it's that same idea, okay? I go and I lift weights today and it's hard. It's hard. And that throws me out of homeostasis. And that drives my body, my nervous system and my muscles and things to adapt. It's going to start to make them want to change so that the next time I do that exact same thing, it doesn't throw me out of homeostasis quite as much. And if you do that consistently, you get out of patience, right? And now it's easier for you. It's better for you or whatever. Okay. Okay. So we're limiting the disruption of homeostasis. So whatever you want to change, you've got to figure out how to stress it in a way that makes that sort of work, okay? Okay, of the things that change, the first thing that changes and the thing that tends to change the most is strength, okay, is strength. This happens very fast. Many of you, and it makes me sad that we don't need to do this, so let's get to but in, in, in the olden days, in the pre-pandemic days, we would do our first lab, like next week. It's a lab about strength. Everybody bench presses. We do a maximal bench press, okay? For a lot of you, never bench press. It's my favorite day of class, okay? My favorite day, we have so much fun, okay? But you could do that. We could have you try to max out on your bench press on one day, come back the next class period, and you're stronger from just attempting to do it because your nervous system changes really fast. So strength is force, okay? We assess your maximal strength by using some kind of specially designed equipment, by doing what's called a one rep max, which is the most weight you can lift at one time, or by doing what's called a multiple rep max, which is I give you a weight you can lift more than once, and I say lift as many times as you can, okay? What's the most weight you can lift four times or six times or eight times, okay? You need to pay attention to range of motion, which needs to have hyphens in it, and the type of muscle action is the front This is the first thing that changes, and it's the thing that tends to change, okay, to the greatest extent. So that's my, my next thing for you guys is going to be, how strong can you get? How much can you increase your maximal strength? Let's say you can bench press 100 pounds. You've never done it before, and you can bench press 100 pounds right now. Okay? If I let you train for six months, a couple of times a week, doing things, how much weight do you think you can bench press in what is February? And then, so in what, in like August, how much, how much weight do you think you can bench? But at least 150, okay? So a 50% increase. Okay. Have any other takers at 150? You think she could do 150? You think you could do 150? Okay. Those of you that don't have them up, I assume you all think you can't you can't go up that much. More? Yeah. How much more? 
at least 200. So 100 percent increase in force. Okay. 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 So I got some that are less, right? In general, if you take a person that is relatively untrained, they've never done something before. They can probably increase their strength with a given muscle group somewhere between maybe 50 to 100 percent. Okay, maybe even more than all of that. Okay, that's a huge amount of strength increase. Okay? A huge amount of strength increase. People that are weaker, they, they have a lower force production to begin with, even have an even greater potential. And you take a trained person, I've already been doing this to some extent. They're not, they may only get like another five or 10% on top of it. There's going to be a point at which it can't go up anymore. Okay. But it's going to go up relatively quickly and it can go up to a very, very large extent. Do you think you could make your muscles twice their size? Absolutely. Yet this is the thing that most people flip. A lot of you think maybe I can't get that much stronger, but I bet I can make my muscles really big, right? If I do this, my muscles are going to get really big. It's actually the opposite, okay? You can all get a lot stronger. Most of us are not going to be able to get our muscles more than maybe 10 or 15 percent. Which for a lot of people is not very much. Okay? You read things and like, oh, this person, and you know, this. I don't know, we're going to pick a football player or a basketball player. Oh, they put on 30 pounds of muscle in the offseason. Bullshit. They did not. Okay. Unless they're taking steroids, no, they did not. They may have added 30 pounds of weight, but it's 15 pounds of muscle across their entire body. They're already a big person. They're 18 and they haven't, you know, they we're not getting that much bigger. Okay. We're just not going to get that much bigger. I mean, you can eat more and get physically bigger, but it's not all going to be muscle. In that particular way. there's just very very limited capacity to increase muscle size that's mostly determined by genetics okay so protein powder don't need it most of you you don't need it unless you're vegetarian doesn't matter okay we don't need those things pre-workouts don't need those either creatine powder don't need that either no go have a cheeseburger you're fine it's gonna all be okay all right so let me, when we talk about, so we talked kind of about this, right? We talked about our strength gains. Let me talk about um, ah, what's going to be worth. So let me talk about how we, how we arrive at those things. Then we'll back up and do something in a different order that you guys have. Okay. So as I said, big increases in strength over the course of maybe three to six months. Those gains, especially if people start off in the same relative state of training. So like I haven't ever done very much. Men and women gain similar relative increases in strength. It took us until the 90s to actually realize this. Okay, the 90s. The guy who was our department chair at the University of Georgia did one of the first studies where they bothered to occur to them that women weren't as strong as men. Maybe we should express their relative increase in strength with training. We can make it relative where they started. The women could lift 50 pounds to start. The guys could lift 100. The women went up 25 pounds. The guys went up 50. And the guys were like, oh, the guys can get stronger. They went up 50 pounds. But they both went up 50%. Uh, now we do everything in this way. We normalize it for every start. Men and women, old and young, basically the same. Okay? Basically the same. The primary thing that drives how much you can increase your strength is how well trained you are initially, okay? How well trained you are initially. If you've never done something, you have this huge capacity to get stronger. If you've been doing that for a while, you have a much reduced capacity, okay? That's a problem, and you guys will start taking lifestyle intervention. Anybody in lifestyle intervention? Okay, Mark, Marissa, Jonathan, you guys. Y'all will learn lifestyle intervention write about theories of why we, we adhere to certain behaviors and other, other kinds of things, behavior change, theory of behavior change. If when you're new to lifting, you get really strong, really fast, and then it stops, most people want to stop working out, okay? Or they want to start lifting to get bigger muscles, and one, they're not going to get that big, and two, it takes a couple of months before they can see anything anyway, then they stop, 
in the method. So there's some problems from adherence with all of that. This is kind of what's happening. So how do you get strong? Well, the first thing that we get better at is the nervous system. You get better at turning on the motor units that are connected to the muscle that you already have. So recruitment goes up, okay? An untrained person, okay? And we, we can do this in my lab, we can do this in several of our labs, Dr. Ferrer's lab, but imagine a scenario where I'm sitting on a thing like this and I'm doing knee extension. Okay, I'm doing this, this is what I'm doing, right? If you ask me to extend as hard as I possibly can, okay? Get as much force as I can. People that are not used to lifting weights and doing this kind of knee extension exercise can probably turn on somewhere between 80 and 85% of the muscle in their knee extenders, okay? You take a person that squats three days a week or two days a week, does some knee extension, that sprints, that does stuff where they practice all of that, okay? They may be able to recruit 95 or 97 or 98% of the muscle in their leg, okay? So what happens is, as you practice this, as you stress the system, one of the first things that occurs is the brain learns how to tell more motor neurons and therefore more of this muscle to get recruited and become active. So I get more force out of the muscle that I have. That's called a neural adaptation. Okay? And it's other, some other times called a learning effect, right? A learning effect. You need to turn the muscle on in a certain way in a certain kind of time, okay? And when you practice that, you get better at it really, really quickly. Right, you get better really quickly. Kind of like riding a bike, right? The other thing that can change is I can make my muscle bigger, so therefore I have more, more active in my life and I can get more cross okay. This is called a contractile protein adaptation. So change in muscle size, right? There's just physically more active in myosin in the muscle. And the hope is that as you get more active in myosin, because the individual fibers have gotten bigger. You don't add fibers, but once you have this get bigger, that you maintain your ability to turn on those fibers. And so as they get bigger, you just get more cross bridges out of that same kind of bridge. Okay? Neural adapt adaptations happen almost immediately. Work out today, you're stronger tomorrow. Okay? You're stronger tomorrow. It takes six to eight weeks to see a measurable increase. And when I say measurable, I mean, you could see it with the naked eye just by looking at your muscles. Or we're able to do some sort of imaging technique like an MRI or a CT scan or an X-ray or a DEXA scan and, and be able to physically measure with on that image that your muscle has gotten bigger. It takes six to eight weeks for that to happen, okay? You can imagine in people that you can create this scenario whereby I'm training over the course of six months, I get stronger. And a lot of it is driven by these neural adaptations early on. They're going to begin to kind of level out as I get better at doing things. And then these increases in muscle size are going to kick in and that's going to go up some. And then, then all of that is going to begin to get really kind of shallow. And as people train for long periods of time, they dramatically diminish their ability to get bigger muscles and stronger muscles. And all you're really doing then is trying to kind of hang on to the last little bits of things that you've got. Okay. All right. When muscles get bigger, we call that hypertrophy. Okay. You make your muscles hypertrophy. Let's be honest, most of our bros that are going to be that are working out right now, that's what they want, right? They want to wear their shirts that are cut way out like this, look at themselves in the mirror over the hub. You all know, you've seen it. Have you all done it? We've all probably done it, right? They want bigger muscles. They want bigger muscles. And that's great. That's good. There's good things about having muscle, right? More muscle means higher metabolic rate. More muscle means more strength in some ways, okay? Atrophy is the, the opposite of hypertrophy. Atrophy is when muscles get smaller, okay? When you age like I do, and all of you will, your muscles, if you will, atrophy to some extent. When you don't do certain things, like you're on bed rest, okay, 
There are these crazy things you guys have probably seen, or maybe you know, you know people like they they got COVID and they had to go on a ventilator and they were in the hospital for like a month or six weeks or whatever, you know, and they lost like 40 or 50 pounds and they can barely walk when they're done because their muscles have atrophy, right? They're just laying in bed for like you know a month, your muscles get smaller. Right? Atrophy happens way faster than hypertrophy. I can put you on um, pick your pick your billionaire who's having a midlife crisis. I can put you on Jeff Bezos's spaceship, or I can put you on Elon Musk's deal, or I can shoot you to the International Space Station. I can put you into space where it's weightless for a week, okay, and you'll lose five to ten percent of your muscle mass by being in space where you're weightless. Okay? We did a study when I was a PhD student. Um, where we had people sort of mimic weightlessness on the ground, which is hard because of gravity. But so we gave people crutches, and they put a big giant platform on, I guess it was their right foot, and you got crutches, and your left leg just like swung free all day long. And when you sat down, you had to prop it up. Okay. So you basically didn't bear any weight on one leg for a month. Okay. And they lost 15 to 20% of the muscle in their quads. And then in, in their gas stock and so on. We paid them a thousand dollars to do it. Every one of them said at the end of the day that they would never do it again. They keep way more than all of that. Okay. But we lose muscle really quickly. Okay. It takes us a lot longer to add it than it does for it to go away. We don't fully really understand you know, the how it's required. We know a lot about the molecular triggers and the things new. We know what needs to get turned on or off to make those things happen. We don't fully understand what the individual signals about not having loading or having this particular kind of loading or training it does or doesn't do some things. Okay. All right. We'll stop here. Okay. We'll pick up with all of this on Monday. Okay. Pick up this on Monday. You guys have a good weekend. Enjoy the nice weather the next couple of days. Make good choices. All right. We'll see you next week.